Hello, my name's Eve Torfik. I'm a British journalist and I'm here interviewing the wonderful Dr. Sam Vaknin about his expertise in narcissism. And um, I work for a British newspaper, but this interview is not conducted on behalf of my work and the opinions are my own and not that of my employer. Okay, so okay. hello. Hello. Nice to see you. The aforementioned text is what is known as disclaimer. So <laughs> now we can get to the uh, to the conversation. Hello, yes. Eve, Eva. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Okay, so um, the questions I'm going to ask you today are have been put to me by people who um, have been in relationships with those they believe to be narcissists. As you've discussed very often um, on your channel, the narcissism is rife online, therefore, but not as prevalent in the community as, you know, the online world would have you believe. So with that in mind, um, one lady asked me to put to you, is there a way to make a way with a uh, relationship with a narcissist work? Well, yes, of course, if you suspend yourself, if you... Uh, no longer display any signs of autonomy, independence. If you become an extension of the narcissist, if you become totally servile and subservient, and if you if you begin even to anticipate the narcissist's needs long before he verbalizes them, and so on and so forth, then this could work, could work in the long term. Narcissists are focused on what I call the four S's. And you, all you need to do is satisfy two of the four in order to, to remain in the narcissist's life for good, for his good, at least. <laughs> and the four S's are uh, sex, supply, either narcissistic or sadistic, if you agree to be the narcissist's punching bag and, you know, allow him to speak to you in a derogatory manner, abuse you, and, I mean, that's, that's fine. That's, that's a fair substitute for narcissistic supply. So supply of any kind, that's the second S. The third S is safety. Um, becoming a doormat so that the narcissist doesn't develop an abandonment anxiety, conforming totally to the narcissist's view of you, in clinical terms is known as an introject, and I call it the snapshot. And then if you conform to this view, 100%, uh, the narcissist doesn't develop abandonment anxiety, so safety, and services. You will find yourself becoming the narcissist's personal assistant, chauffeur, um, chambermaid, um, and so on and so forth in due time. Ultimately, the relationship degenerates into a very transactional arrangement where you provide two of the four S's and the narcissist graces you with his eternal presence. And that's the only benefit that a partner of a narcissist who was wanting to make it work uh, would get, the presence of the narcissist who they believe to be omnipotent, omnipowerful, etc., based on the shared fantasy that you often describe in your videos? Yes, the narcissist regards himself as a deity in, in many respects. Not himself, actually, because he doesn't have a self, but he regards his false self as a deity. The narcissist himself worships his false self, sacrifices to the false self, and it's the equivalent of a cult or a sect Narcissism is missionary. He tries to, con as an intimate partner, he tries to convert you to, to fit into, to, to follow his creed, to become an adherent of this one-man cult. And so you should be honored to be among the first disciples and apostles of this new faith. And Like some Charlie Manson style, you know, thing uh, going on. Charlie Manson, Jim, I mean, uh, the Kool-Aid incident, and there are many many others. Yes, the, the general idea is that you, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and experience to be in the presence of a reincarnated God, a God who is flesh and blood. Even the sex with the narcissist is a mystical experience, even if it's bad, especially if it's bad. <laughs> it's a mystical experience, and you should be overwhelmed. How is it mystical? Can you describe, say, layman's terms? How is it a mystical experience? Well, it's uniting, it's, it's uniting with the ocean. It's uniting with the divine. The narcissist is Is that universe. in the narcissist mind, or yes. is that in the mind of the No, it's, a, it's in the narcissist mind. 
Oh, he, I see. He regards sex as an example, but he regards any interaction actually as affording you the unique um, opportunity to interact with higher planes of existence. It's ex exactly a mystical experience in his mind. And so you should be eternally grateful. And you should, of course, display your gratitude in a variety of ways, the four S's. And here is magnanimous because two of four would suffice. He doesn't demand all four consistently. And, you know, so two of four is being, is, is concessionary. He's giving you a concession. Here. Okay. Because um, I find it interesting, despite um, a wealth of advice that women or men or any victim of a narcissist should go no contact and just leave, never speak to them again, that there are actually people out there who want to make this um, style of relationship work. Um, what type of person would that be? I, I know you've touched on it in other videos, but in a nutshell, what kind of person would want to make a relationship with a narcissist work? Does it mean they're extremely empathetic, as they claim? Or is it somebody with such low self-esteem that they they need to have a deity in order to survive? Well, I'm glad that you asked this question. And no, we did not coordinate the questions. Um, and I didn't receive the questions in advance. So I'm glad you asked this question because it's a hell of a lot of confusion. The narcissist is promiscuous as far as mate selection, anyone who would provide him with the four, with two of the four S's would do sex, services, safety, and supply. Anyone who provides him with two of the four would do as an intimate partner, so-called. <laughs> I, I, call, I, call, I call his partners in, insignificant others. Yeah? So anyone would do. The narcissist is not selective. However, it is true that certain types of personality are attracted inexorably to the narcissist. Mm -hmm. So this creates a lot of confusion because it looks from the outside, it looks as if the narcissist is being selective because we keep get, getting the same types of mating, the same types of couples. We say, you see, the narcissist ends up with codependence all the time. Yeah, but not by his choice. It's the codependent who chooses the narcissist. Yeah, the because that, yeah. that's often said uh, by a lot of people People, oh, I keep picking the same man, or I, oh, I seem to end up oh. with the same woman. You know, yes. is this just the psyche matching the other psyche, and that it, you know inevitably, you know, yeah. forms this big but bang? Is it, is it to get confused because looking at the phenomenon, you say, well, you see, the same types of partners keep ending up with the narcissist. Yes, but it's not the narcissist doing. Anyhow, to answer your question, there are mm -hmm. two things these people are looking for: self-love an experience of self-love and an experience of something bigger than themselves who or which can subsume them safely, a sense of safety. And I'll elaborate on these two, uh, mainly because I like the sound of my voice. So... <laughs> and the sound of your voice is very fantastic. Thank does that, you. Does that, give, does that give you supply? Of course, I can't have the other three S's at least, you know, give me the, the fourth. <laughs> um, the, um, let's start with self-love. The narcissist provides you with the equivalence of motherhood. He provides you with unconditional love in the sense that he love bombs, bombs you and then idealizes you. It's exactly what mothers do when they have a new baby. They idealize the baby, of course, because babies are a pain in many unspecified parts of the anatomy. The mother needs to idealize the baby in order to persevere and survive. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So mothers do this, they idealize, and then they provide unconditional love. Now, unconditional love doesn't mean lack of discipline or lack of boundaries. Or that, that's not what it means. It means loving the child for his or her essence, loving yes. the child essentially yeah. as an essence. Mm -hmm. The narcissist does this to you. He love bombs you and then he idealizes you and then he grants you access to your own idealized image through his gaze. So you are mothering yourself through the narcissist's gaze. And for the first time in the life of many of his partners, 
they feel, they experience self-love. And this is an intoxicating sensation. It's very difficult to let go of this. It's addictive. The second, the second way the narcissist gets you hooked and conditioned even, conditioned is a much more rigorous term in psychology, but definitely hooked is um, the feeling that he is so unique, so unprecedented, so special, so accomplished, so everything that being with him, being chosen by him is a privilege. And not only is it a privilege, but you get included or you get inducted into something that is bigger than you. Again, it's the equivalent of religion. I've got to say that that cult-like element seems to be surfacing yes. again. Yes, it's, it's the absolute equivalent of a, of a religion. It may be a one-man religion, but it's still a religion. And you are you are the worshipper or the follower or the adherent or the fan or whatever you want to call yourself. And so fan, by the way, is short for fanatic. It's a, it comes from the word fanatic. So you become a missionary. You become a missionary on behalf of the narcissist. For example, partners of narcissists are very defensive of the narcissist. When the narcissist is challenged or attacked or criticized, they tend to defend the narcissist vehemently and aggressively. Um, for the first time in the lives of many of these partners, they have an organizing principle and an explanatory principle. Principle. It's called hermeneutic principle. Suddenly, the world the world makes sense. Suddenly, there's meaning and direction and goal, and it all emanates from this godhead, the narcissist. And suddenly, you can suspend your own responsibility, your own accountability, the tedium of having to make decisions. You can hand them over to the narcissist and you feel safe. Now, exactly the same dynamic plays out in dictatorships. Exactly. People hand over responsibility, accountability, decision-making, choices. They hand them over to the Fuhrer, you know, and Hitler knows better, knows best. And that's it. Now, well, he does. It reduces I don't anxiety. mean that literally, by yeah. the way. Yeah. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't know best. But when it comes one, to... One more sentence with your permission. It, it's, an, it's, an anxio, it's an anxiolytic. It reduces anxiety. Being with a narcissist reduces anxiety. It's exactly like self-medicating. Would you say then, it, leading on from that, would you then say it produces anxiety later on? Because often victims of narcissists say one of the things that define their relationship with the, the narcissist is the the crippling anxiety, the not knowing, the the constant gut feelings that were ignored, the the times where you know they, they knew they were cheating or they knew there was something going wrong and they're just they they've got a huge amount of anxiety. It's so what you're describing sounds initially that it's soothed and then it comes back, you know, tenfold. Yes, you could call it a rebound effect. A little like COVID. <laughs> it's a rebound effect. The narcissist misleads you, soothes you, kind of artificially induces in you the equivalent of anesthesia. You are put under the spell. You are enchanted. But then inexorable dynamics within the narcissist cause him to push you away and then to devalue you and then to cheat on you, which is a form of devaluation. And then, you know, everything. And then, of course, your anxiety skyrockets. But your anxiety skyrockets because you're terrified to lose the narcissist. Yeah, yeah. That's the thing. When you're the uncertainty stage, which, again, I've heard from victims as I've been collecting my own day. So, you know, the, the stage where the narcissist is pulling away, they've found a better source of supply or a different source of supply, and you're very uncertain. And you're sitting there going, well, am I with them? Am I not? They, they're breadcrumbing me and all this kind of thing. So, yeah. Yes, it's, it's a fear of, fear of loss, actually. So it's not and true that, pe that the partner becomes anxious because she wants to terminate or break up with the narcissist or something. That is post facto justifications. I mean, look how strong I am. I broke up with the narcissist. I, I, I'm an empath or a super galactic empath. That's the latest I've heard. 
in so einem super galactischen Bad. I'm kidding you. <lacht> oh I'm not kidding you. I'm, I'm sorry, a super galactic empire. Yes, well, you know. What what what's one of those? Can you tell me what one of those actually is? A super galactic empath is an empath to times to the to the power of ten or something or thousand or something. It's, oh, I see. So it's, it's, all, have... it's all forms of grandiosity. Yes. But, okay, they're let's they're not they're let's high. not fall down the, the empath rabbit hole. Let, um, let's not. I just yeah, yeah. It, it's it's that's a very interesting subject as well. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you as well because this isn't often covered. Um, hugely how can you tell if one of your friends is a narcissist because this one i find very difficult to define uh, a relationship i would say listening to your good self i'm pretty well versed on how to avoid one if you know um the case arises that a friend say a, a close female friend of mine how would i be able to tell if she is a narcissist is there such a thing, a close female friend? Is that possible um, at all? <laughs> um, I would say I have uh, female friends who I would regard as uh, the sisters I never had. Yeah, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, us yeah. women can be tricky on occasion. Yes, indeed. On many occasions. Um, mm. There, clinically, in clinical settings and academic seti settings, we make a distinction between what we call narcissistic style it's so a coinage by Lynn Sperry. Um, and a narcissistic personality, which is Milan's contribution, and narcissistic disorder. Now, there's a debate whether these are merely uh, gradations on a spectrum. It's like more of the same is a personality and, and much more of the same is a disorder. Or whether there are substantial essential differences. And I subscribe to the second camp. Narcissistic style is an a-hole, simply put, not to, not to elaborate too much on. I mean, anyone you meet is a jerk, that's probably someone with a narcissistic style. The, mm -hmm. emphasis, the emphasis there would be on grandiosity, not so much on lack of empathy. Someone with a narcissistic style is actually capable of empathy, including emotional empathy, but is so grandiose that his grandiosity being a cognitive distortion provides him with the wrong information about reality. So he acts in ways which are injurious, abrasive, etc., etc. So that's a narcissistic style. And there are many people like that, of course. Mm -hmm. By some yeah. estimates, 15, 20 percent of the population, by some estimates. So sorry to um, interrupt. Yeah. If I, were I to give you a very quick example of um what i would call a narcissistic style would you be able to confirm for me whether this level of grandiosity is um indicative of disorder or style so I essentially I, I essentially would. female a um lives a very comfortable life um she comes across as quite eloquent quite well read um fairly unassuming and quite kind but then underneath that is um, the first of all quiet mention of their qualifications and then the increase in mention of their qualifications, say they've, they're a doctor or they've got a PhD or they've just bought a yacht or something like that. And, you know, you start to see these little flashes almost beneath the mask of this very sweet, almost the most normal person in the room. But then when you look back on your friendship, you can see all along that there were these markers of grandiosity. Would you say that was a narcissist you were dealing with or just a, an a-hole with a narcissistic style? Depends crucially whether these, what you call markers, um, are fantastic. In other words, they're not real, they're lies or confabulations. Or whether they are merely uh, overemphasis of actual accomplishments. Overemphasis of actual accomplishments um, in a setting where they would be um, used to impress. He has a yacht. Can I have a number? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that that person's for me. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's um, it's it's style. If the if the bragging and so on is based on is an exaggeration or a hyperbole, hyperbole based on reality, then mm -hmm. in most cases it's style. 
um, the transition to a narcissistic personality involves evolved uh, fantasy defenses and a lot of confabulation. Confabulation is not lying. Confabulation is simply bridging memory gaps uh, by inventing plausible scenarios of what might have happened, could have happened, should have happened, and probably happened. End of story. <laughs> so this is called confabulation. And so this marked the transition to a personality, um, narcissistic personality, and then the lack of empathy, exploitativeness, extreme envy, entitlement, added onto this foundation, these become, this, this render the person someone with narcissistic personality disorder. In that case, I think I have to uh, reevaluate some people I know. Good luck with it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, somebody who poses as innocent, but that would uh, cheat on their husband or sleep with a friend's husband, or, uh, but poses as extremely innocent, you know, this kind of thing. You know, they're, they're very smart, they're very sweet, and they're, they're always very moral when you ask them for advice. But on, beneath that veneer is addiction, lies, deception, that kind of thing. So if I, was looking, if I was looking for a female friend, and that's what I came across, is that safe to say that is somebody to avoid and that is a narcissistic style? Well, regardless of whether it is narcissistic style, it's definitely someone to avoid. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. What you're describing... It's much closer to psychopathy, actually, than to. Oh, muscle. really? There's a huge confusion, of course, because of all the self-styled experts online. There's a yes, huge, huge yes. confusion between narcissism and psychopathy because, mm -hmm. because both narcissists and psychopaths are grandiose. Grandiosity is common to both disorders, and actually to borderline as well. And borderline, when she is or he is stressed, rejected, humiliated, abandoned. In reality, or an, in an anticipatory manner, she becomes a psychopath too. Albeit secondary a different, psychopathy. Secondary, yeah, albeit a different kind, yes. Secondary. So it's very confusing, which is why the international classification of diseases, which is the, the global competitor to the DSM, has eliminated all these nonsensical differential diagnosis, all these, all these um, uh, demarcations and borders between and just created a single disorder. Because people do transition from borderline to psychopathy to narcissism and back. Very often, actually. And it's very confusing because psychopaths, for example, when, they're exp when they fail, when it's called the collapse state, when, when we have a collapsed psychopath, a psychopath who has had a goal and has failed in obtaining the goal, such a psychopath becomes very much like a narcissist. And a narcissist who is uh, dramatically injured, uh, narcissistic injury or mo mortified, humiliated in public, for example, and so on, becomes borderline, totally borderline. He becomes emotionally dysregulated, reckless, and so on and so forth. So these distinctions are very, um, they're not useful, you know, they, they're very misleading and problematic. The person you've described acts with premeditation to deceive that is much closer to a psychopath. Narcissists are actually pro-social because they rely cr critically on other people for the maintenance of very important psychological functions and needs. So they can't afford to alienate people big time or to become asocial or antisocial and so on. So many, I mean many of the narcissists who act criminally or antisocially or or injuriously or abrasive, are actually psychopathic narcissists or pure out psychopaths. So what would, um, and this is another one, maybe a bit on the different side, what would the child of the psychopath or narcissist look like? What would their behavior be like? It's crucially, critically depends on the child. And on the environment. For example, if the parents are narcissistic or psychopathic and the grandmother and grandfather are wonderful people. So it, it depends on, on too, many, too, many, too many factors to enumerate. If a child is exposed exclusively to a narcissistic or psychopathic parent in an environment which is isolating, and such a parent would try to isolate the child in order to fully control the child, 
would try to instrumentalize the child and to parentify the child and to abuse the child in a variety of ways. So in many cases, children are locked into a trap with a narcissistic or psychopathic parent unable to exit and have no recourse to anyone, institutions included. Institutions are very neglectful because they don't recognize narcissism and psychopathy as risk factors. You know, if you molest a child sexually, you end up in prison, well, in the best case. But if you molest a child emotionally, nothing happens. End of story. So this You mentioned are... um, emotional incest in your content um, a lot. Um, can you give me like three core examples of emotional incest, please? Emotional incest is any situation where the child is cast as a partner, intimate partner. So conspiring with the child against the other spouse, you know, you're, you're my real love. I don't love your father. Look at your father, what he's doing to me. Come and, co come and console me. Come and comfort me. That's an example. Or breaking boundaries. For example, walking naked in front of the child or having sex in front of the child or masturbating in front of the child, which happens more often than you know. Ah, uh, well, these are, well, you know, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, these are, these are, this, this is a breach of boundaries, which is definitely a kind of emotional incest. Then there is emotional blackmail. I sacrifice my life for you. You owe me. If you walk away, I will die. And so on and so forth. This creates merger and fusion, inability to separate, which has sexual dimensions. Everything has sexual dimensions. Freud, Freud was right about this, especially when you are a child and then you grow up, puberty and so on. Sex enters the equation inevitably, ineluctably, there's nothing you can do about it. So even the simple message, I depend on you for my life, I sacrifice my life for you, don't ever leave me, has a sexual dimension. Implicit. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds more like an intimate partner than it yes. does a parent. Yes. I mean, it's, and that, that actually brings me to another question. Um, I know you've done videos on this before, but I'm just trying to nutshell these things. Um, as much as I can, because that's what journalists are meant to do, not um, scare remember, people, remember by the way. You remember your disclaimer? I do, yes. <laughs> um, no, uh, we're not scaremongering evil human beings. Um, we're here to educate and inform. Indeed. Anyway, this one um, <laughs> so you mentioned the cerebral narcissist, of which you yourself claim to be. Um, becomes uh, predominantly asexual after the initial stage of rampant sex. I think that was in an interview in 2019 with your wife. Could have, um, could have. I don't remember dates. Yeah. I do. <laughs> but so when you moved from, you know, the, the rampant sex stage to this cerebral asexual, you know, I, it almost the way you described it remind, reminded me of a you know Jean Paul Sartre that kind of thing like you know locked in a room full of papers while uh, de Beauvoir was you know frantically mm -hmm. writing her heartbreak anyway um, so it kind of reminds me of that um, how do you go from rampant sex to that where's the transition I, I mean do you just switch off your sex drive or it was the sex drive there to begin with and it just fades to repulsion or do you, do you find um you know the, the body is no longer serving you as it needs to serve you therefore I've, I've had enough now how does that work well we need to discuss three concepts very briefly one is uh type inconstancy one is sublimation and one is gray sexuality so type, type inconstancy simply means that there is no constant type. A, cere a cerebral can become, not, very often does become, narcissist, especially if a cerebral experiences collapse, cannot derive supply um, on a regular basis or sufficient supply, def has a deficient supply state. So in, in this case, he, he, he becomes somatic. I have become somatic six years ago, and I'm still somatic. I'm not cere cerebral now. So um, there's no type constancy. Okay. And, um, so this is point number one. Point number two is sublimation. It's a process described, first described, of course, by who else? Sigmund Freud. And Freud suggested that we convert drives, especially if the drive is socially unacceptable in some way or frowned upon, 
we convert these drives into socially acceptable activities. So rather than rape women in the streets, for example, we write books. So writing the book consumes your energy, consumes your life force, the libido. So you have no libido left for sex. And this is called sublimation. And the third, uh, third in my view, more important concept even is gray sexuality. It's a recent concept, it's, it's emerging. It's not clinically recognized, but I think it describes a real thing. Um, there are people whose sex drive is either unstable, so it can vanish completely for years and then reappear and then vanish again and so on. We don't know why. It may be a, a totally healthy state, we're not sure. Asexuality is a subset of this. Total mm -hmm. asexuality, lack of sexual attraction to any potential partner. It's a subset of this. And we don't consider asexuality to be a pathology, just a kind of social, a sexual orientation. So po possibly gray sexuality is not a pathology. So one thing in gray sexuality is that it is uh, unstable. The sex drive is unstable. And the second thing, the sex drive has to be triggered. While in a normal healthy person, or shall we say normal person, the sex drive is pretty constant. And the only triggers are visual cues or whatever. And they are, they are widespread. So you're constantly excited and roused in principle. In principle. With people who, who are gray sexuals, they need a highly specific trigger. For example, one of the sub-variants of gray sexuality is known as demisexuality. Yeah, I was about to mention uh, yeah. demisexuality. Yeah. Exactly. So demisexuals cannot have sex and have experienced no sexual attraction until they get very deeply emotionally involved. That's the trigger. So it's a highly specific trigger. It's not your boobs and not you know any other anatomical part of you. It's that they have to be triggered by emotions. Deep emotions, not just any. Not, yeah, not, I've heard about for this. Example, they affection. have to have, they have to have a connection. So, uh, would you say that? Would you would you say that's more akin to a cerebral narcissist experience of sex? All narcissists are gray sexual. To cut a long story. All of them. Okay, so what they have to experience, they because you've got this image of a narcissist as a uh, promiscuous predator. Um, but from what you're saying, that sounds more like a psychopath. So I'm trying to yes. separate that out. Psychopath or sexual sadist, by the way. All, yep. narcissists, all narcissists are grey sexuals in the sense that all of them go through periods where they are not sexually active and experience no sexual attraction, clinically rendering them asexual. So, so sexual anorexia then? Yes, they, they all go through these periods. And these periods are triggered by a lack of supply, this depression and dysphoria, owing to a lack of supply, etc., etc. They become schizoid, they isolate themselves, and they have no sex drive. Sex drive is gone. End of story. That's actually the cerebral phase. Even so, for themselves, even with, you know, masturbation. Yes, even that declines dramatically, although in the vast majority of cases, they do masturbate because they're auto-erotic. They perceive their bodies as the supreme, ultimate, sexually arousing thing. By the way, having sex with the narcissist is the narcissist having sex with himself using your body to masturbate. Even with so a you're, just, you're just a flashlight, yeah? Even, even Yeah, you're exactly. You're just, yeah. So, even with the somatic. Somatic is, is focused on conquests and the chase much less so on, on pleasing you, although he would be very concerned with how many orgasms you had, because it goes down in his diary. Not a, it's, yeah, it's, that's his. So, his you know, somebody, yeah. so if, it, if I were to meet a gentleman out, out there one day, and um, he was concerned about my sexual pleasure as a reflection on himself, as opposed to my disappointment, it, well, the, a healthy person would ask you, uh, "Did you was it was it pleasant? Did you was it a good time for you? Did you enjoy? Can I do anything else? Can you teach me how to please you?" And so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. A somatic narcissist would ask you, "Was I good? Was I good? Did you come?" That's a somatic narcissist. And a cerebral narcissist in a somatic phase initially, like if he's just transitioned, like last week, 
his transition. He wouldn't even ask you anything. He would just masturbate with you auto-erotically. He would just that use the body. Very cold. That, that sounds very cold, very, you know, you know, you're just a, a, you know, like how a dog has its favorite thing to use. Narcissists are incapable of perceiving other people as separate entities because they have never gone through a separation phase with their own mothers. Mm -hmm. They've never experienced separation. They've never experienced being separate. So they don't know how to do separateness. <laughs> they, they don't regard you as separate. They regard you as an, as an object. And, and even worse, an internal object. So when they have sex with you, they invest emotionally and sexually a process called cathexis. They invest all the energy in the internal object representing you, which represents you in their minds. Narcissism, exactly as Kernberg said decades ago, and no one listened to him, narcissism is seriously close to psychosis. Seriously. It's almost a psychotic disorder. It's almost a total divorce from reality. Narcissists live 99% within the thick skulls and interact with everyone and everything inside, never outside. Narcissists are incapable of, of discerning external objects. So when we talk about um, sex and love addiction um, in psychology, which is a subject that I've been looking into, um, sex and love addiction, there is a huge preoccupation with fantasy. Um, the sex and love addict, as it will be termed, lives in fantasy um with the the love object would you say people who are sex and love addicts are um close to psychotic or narcissistic or is this something separate love addiction is what is known as a process addiction these people mm -hmm. are not emotionally invested in the partner in any way shape or form they're emotionally invested in the fantasy or is that not like the narcissist. Yes, the narcissist is also emotionally invested in the fantasy, but there's a major difference. That's why not all love, well, a minority of love addicts are narcissists. The narcissist is invested in the fantasy because he is at the center of the fantasy. So in a way, he's invested in a fantastic view of himself. The love addict is invested in a fantasy where the fantastic object is the other. Not herself, but the other. That's a crucial difference. So the the love addict is is invested in a process. She regards the other person as a facilitator of the process, and she's invested emotionally in the process. In other words, the love addict is in love, loves being in love. She's in love with love, and then the partner just is a facilitator, allows her to be in love with love. So she loves him because he allows her to be in love with love. The narcissist is a very different story. The narcissist doesn't love or is emotionally invested in any way, shape or form in his partner. His partner is there because the shared fantasy requires a replay of dynamics with the mother. Let's take a break now and reconvene in five minutes. Is that okay? Yep, that's fine. I'll see you in five. See you soon. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, so love addicts themselves need other people and the narcissist experiences love in a very different way. So, this brings me to another question, a very bizarre one that I hope you'll be able to answer. Um, so essentially I'm you've a, got... I'm a bizarre person, so it's very likely. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, um, discussions amongst um, girlfriends, you know, we often have fantasies, um, historical fantasies sometimes, you know, Vikings, what have you. Um, <laughs> you <Vikings>? know. It, <laughs> Is this legal? <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever it is, you know, you often before bed, you go into this sort of fantasy world, or if you listen to music, you go into a fantasy world. Um, 
you know, is is that normal or is that narcissistic? That's what we want to know. Are we? I mean, is everyone I've spoken to about this? You know, are we all narcissists here? No, narcissism is not about having a fantasy. Fantasy is a psychological defense mechanism that is common to all humanity. As long as you're able to tell the difference between fantasy and reality, okay. which a narcissist is incapable of, and as long as the aim of the fantasy is the fantasy itself, the process, the story, the narrative, which is not the case with the narcissist. In the case of the narcissist, the core, the pivot, is the narcissist, not the story, not the narrative. That's why it's very easy for the narcissist to discard you. Because it's all about him, not about you, not about what, we, what you have together with him, not about even your shared fantasy. It's about him. So having a fantasy, realizing that it is a fantasy, or even pursuing a fantasy, there's nothing wrong with it, nothing unhealthy in this. So we can carry on thinking about Vikings and Tudors and Jason Momoa and, you know... I regret Jason. very much that you're not thinking about Moroccan Jews instead of uh, Vikings, but, you know, <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> it's not me with the Vikings, it was someone else with the oh, Vikings. Oh, right, I'm relieved to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I thought I'd ask that one for them, um, because the word fantasy often comes up, you know, and let that me, interest. Let me clarify me. maybe with one sentence. Maybe that will be more helpful than all my ruminations. The love addict is invested emotionally in love. She loves to be in love. And she is grateful to her partner because he allows her to be in love with love. He allows her to experience love. So consequently, she loves him because he's a source of goodies. You know, he allows her to experience love. The narcissist is, it's all about him. It's not about the fantasy. It's not about any emotion. It's not about an, an interaction. It's not about a collaboration. It's not about nothing. It's all about him. The partner is there because the script of the fantasy says that there has to be a mother figure there but anyone would do you're all fungible the partner is fungible anyone would do so if i were to tell somebody who i suspected to be a narcissist or who was a narcissist and um, the reason say all their wives left them was because they were a terrible human being and they treated them horribly what would that internally what 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 would be going on there? Would they reflect at all? I, I'm pretty sure the answer is no. Um, but would there be any type of reflection on that? Well, maybe it was me, or would it be an absolutely aghast? How dare you suggest that I gave them the world? They should have been honoured to be with me. They're all bitches. Much more likely the second. However, there is a weight of cumulative evidence. Ultimately, the narcissist does hit rock bottom. And he hits rock bottom in one of two ways. He loses absolutely everything, which has happened to me. And led me to self-awareness and through self-awareness to actually initiating the topic of narcissism, online at least. So this was a beneficial development in my case. Yeah. But there's, but there's another way of reaching, of reaching rock bottom, of exploring rock bottom. Simply too many repetitions of the same failures. So, for example, too many repetition, repetitions of romantic failures, too many repetitions of business failures. For ultimately, it pierces the narcissist's defenses, and he goes through a process called decompensation. And then he says, wait a minute, I've, I've, like, it's my 29th relationship, and it's, it's even I, and I'm, I'm, reality intrudes finally. And then he does. Then not even the most hardcore resilient narcissist does does realize that something is wrong with him and does seek help actually isn't that contrary to you know i mean i think your case is rather novel i know there are other self-aware narcissists but I, it would it take it would take rock bottom surely for the self-awareness to be induced and even so with the you know, say you've got a low functioning, low IQ narcissist, would they be would they be able to escape that, you know, lack of awareness? They would probably become politicians. Um, the 
No, self-awareness comes to all narcissists. The question is how they how do they react to the self-awareness? Some of them become self-aware and they say, I'm glad I'm this way. It endows me with an evolutionary advantage. I'm the next, I'm the next step in the evolutionary ladder. I'm superior. I'm I'm Homo sapiens 2.0, you know. Do you do you think that? About myself. Yeah. No, my, my narcissism is, is no, no, absolutely. I am endowed. Not the way you think. I'm endowed with with you know an IQ, which probably places me above the vast majority of people. That's not necessarily grandiosity. It seems, sounds to me like fact based, <laughs> but I do not regard my narcissism as an asset or a gift the way many narcissists do. You know, they they would say, yes, I may be an a hole, I may be abrasive, I may be, but I'm tough. I'm a go getter. I'm a dare doer. I'm a daring do. You know, I'm 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 amazing. I, I get things done. I and so they glorify themselves. They glamorize the disorder, thereby entrenching it. Then it's impossible to help them in any way, shape, or form. You go to someone like Donald Trump. You tell him, mm -hmm. Mr. Trump, you're a malignant narcissist. You have a serious pathology. Say, really? <laughs> Is this the same pathology that got me to the White House and to be a multi-billionaire? Um, do you seriously advise me to get rid of it? It's it's an narcissism had become an evolutionary a, a positive adaptation in today's Western civilization. Not only Western, no, a global civilization. It's good to be a narcissist. It pays to be a narcissist. And many many parents encourage their children, and, and many education systems encourage students to become narcissists. What if you don't want to be a narcissist, but you want to have healthy self-esteem, but you're concerned if your self-esteem reaches a certain level, then that will cross the border into um, narcissism, which will ultimately hurt others. Because I think a lot of people are sort of towing this line. Well, I want to love myself, but when when does loving myself become unhealthy? When does self-love become grandiose and you know i as a young woman and a millennial you know keep away <laughs> never um, never disclose your age <laughs> <laughs> um you know that that's something i personally and i think a lot of women my age and and men um struggle with yes because they there's a conf there's confusion or conflation of self-love and narcissism narcissism is the opposite of self-love mm -hmm. Narcissism doesn't involve total self-awareness and self-acceptance. Narcissist is aware of certain behaviors and definitely is not aware of his own dynamics and voices, internal voices, and cannot tell the difference between external objects and internal objects. His reality testing is short. Narcissists are very far from, from knowing everything there is to know about themselves and about their place in reality and about the boundaries between themselves and reality, which is a foundational cornerstone of self-love. Because how can you love yourself if you don't know who you are? That's the first thing. And the second thing, narcissism is compensatory. It compensates for a deep, deep set sense of inadequacy. We call it a bad object internalization, internal bad object. A sense of yeah. inadequacy, of being unworthy, of being a failure, of being ugly or stupid or... Or, you know, and so to compensate for this, the narcissist projects an image, the false self creates a construct, which is everything the narcissist is not. This image is omnipotent and the narcissist is helpless. This image is omniscient and the narcissist is far less than omniscient. And so in a way, the, the false self soothes the inner self. The false self saves the inner <laughs> self. You know, it's, it's almost the the warrior that protects the crying child in the corner. I, I, I would go even, I would use an even more stark metaphor or, or simile or imagery. It's the, it's the plug, it's a plug-in for the black hole. The, the narcissist is a black hole. And it's a black hole and around the black hole, there are swirling stars or galaxies. These are the internal objects. And the false self plugs into the black hole and gives the narcissist the erroneous impression that there is no black hole, 
that there is some entity there, that there is some existence. The narcissist is an absence, is not an existence in any way, shape or form. It comes exceedingly close to medieval, you know, fairy tales and, and possession stories and, and so on. The, these people in the Middle Ages, they didn't have the vocabulary that we have today, which I'm not sure is an advantage, mind you, <laughs> or disadvantage. Yeah. yeah. So they didn't have the vocabulary we have today. They used a different vernacular or different vocabulary. So they, they would say demon possessed, you know? or they would say the, 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 uh, it's an absence or there's nobody there. They were very terrified, by the way, of, of, of non-entities. That's the allure of ghosts. They're not there, really. It's, you know, so this is the narcissist. It is an apparition. Now, it's very misleading because here you are talking to me and I have chubby cheeks on a good day and I smile and I'm sufficiently intelligent to cover up for my black hole, exist non-existence. Yeah, I mean, you seem perfectly personable, pleasant, intelligent, normal yeah. human being. Yeah, and in, in, in real life, um, I know how to be charming because I'm manipulative and so on and so forth. And it's exceedingly misleading because you get the impression of a presence. Not only a presence, but in my case, a dominant presence. Yeah, I, definitely. I, I would say you I, have an yeah. identity. I'm looking yes. at an identity right now. And I see how people react when I enter rooms and so on. I have a dominant presence, but it's, it's not there. It's all fake. It's make-believe. It's, it's uh, really bizarre. Yes, it's an absence. Language fails. Uh, our language, all languages, are, are geared towards dealing with entities, not with non-entities. When we try to talk about zero, the concept of zero, the concept when we fail, the language fails us. It's interesting um, because you mentioned about this void and this black hole. Um, and there's no way of curing it, and there's no way of coming out of the black hole. Is that not something, do you think, um, with progression in psychology that, that could be cured, that could be helped? No. And the damage is inflicted in very critical years of life. They're known as the formative years, between age zero and six years. And many, many things that form or coalesce in these years are rather immutable, rather unchangeable. For example, contrary to nonsense online, your attachment style in the vast majority of cases is lifelong. And there's very little you can do about it. Now, of course, the self-help industry and even the psychotherapy industries, they have a vested interest to lie to you or to mislead you or to give you false hope. For money, yeah? For money, absolutely. And so money corrupts. Money absolutely corrupts. Oh, I can believe that. Yeah. Well, take take the simple fact that eight out of ten psychological experiments cannot be replicated. That's a fact. This is a disastrous state of things. The truth is that some things that happen to you as a child are irreversible and immutable. End of story. That includes a lack of empathy. That includes your attachment style. And that includes the fact that you were not allowed to become. You are not allowed to separate and become an individual, a process known as separation individuation. So you have never become. Because you've never become, you are not. <laughs> as a narcissist, I mean, yeah? The so, narcissist is, is not, yeah. In terms of attachment style, I'm going to be a bit personal now, but this is just for the interest because this i think throws a slight anomaly out there when it comes to attachment style say you did have a loving mother but you were born prematurely and kept in an incubator for the first few months of your life and you didn't get that sort of skin to skin contact that is essential for human bonding you know would that cause a anxious or scattered attachment style or could you develop a secure attachment is the attachment style related less to these sort of evolutionary needs and more to the emotional needs created by society we see today? Attachment style develops over many years. So, and it's more or less in its final form in early puberty. Okay. So 
there is a lot of flexibility and malleability um, during these years. And you can definitely switch from one attachment style to another prior to age 12 or something. But having concluded with adolescence, you are very unlikely to change your attachment style. It can happen. It does happen, usually following trauma or you know, severe events, but normally not. Now, the lack of skin-to-skin -skin touch up to age six months is, in principle, a deprivation. It's, it's de you know, you're deprived of a very important uh, element. You're likely to develop a depressive stance, what is called a schizoid depressive stance, as a baby. You're likely to withdraw. As a baby? As a baby. You're likely to withdraw, to be sad. Um, and so on and so forth. There will be initial issues of distrust with the mother. But if the mother is persistent and loving and caring, this will all be forgotten and will have no impact later in life. So your okay. attachment style will be determined much later. Um, okay, so it, it's it's multifactorial. It isn't just, you know... And it's a long process. It's a long process. Yeah. And would you say people with uh, a defined attachment style, say you've got two avoidant attachments, are they better to be together or are you better to go for some, not that you, you know, not that it's a first date question, what's your attachment style, I'll tell you mine. Um, are you likely to get on better with somebody with the same style? There is a big debate whether attachment styles are genetically determined inherited because we do know for example of babies who are born with an inability to attach this is called reactive attachment disorder okay so there is a big debate about this regarding this if it is genetically determined then you are more likely to survive with someone of the opposite genetic profile okay. sexual sexual and romantic attraction is responsive to opposition in genetic profiles when you meet when you meet a, a new potential partner, you immediately exchange a molecule, an, an actual molecule, which contains about 100 bits of information about your genetic composition and about your immune immunological system. Yeah, because immune systems have to be diverse in order to be attracted. Exactly, yeah. and you're attracted actually to the opposite. So if, yeah. if attachment style is genetically determined, it's one answer. If it is determined by upbringing or nurture, which we don't know yet, by upbringing or nurture, you're more likely to survive in someone who has the same attachment style. For example, imagine that you're avoidant and the other person is secure, or this will create a situation of clinging, uh, clinging and insecurity and uh, neediness and, you know, <laughs> create bad dynamics. But if you're both avoidant, you're likely to establish a long distance relationship. You're likely to meet once a week or twice a week, have fun, not to mention other things. And, you know, just say goodbye for the next four days. And you're likely to feel wonderful because you maintain your personal space and so on. These yeah, are all the so avoidant. All the avoidant. Yeah, that, that, that sounds good, actually. Yeah, that's, that sounds easy. So, I, if you ask my personal opinion, but it's an opinion, it's total speculation at this stage. I think uh, you should have the same attachment style. I think it's calling, asking for trouble. If you team up with someone who is absolutely the opposite attachment side to yours, his needs will not be satisfied, your needs will not be satisfied, you will impinge on each other, you get on each other's nerves, and, you know, <laughs> and badly and acrimoniously. I just gave you an example of what we call insecure avoidant attachment style, avoidant dismissive or avoidant fearful, there are all kinds of avoidances. Avoidance should be together because they settle into a pattern that allows, allows them to avoid intimacy, they don't feel threatened, they don't invade each other's space, they don't make demands on each other, and so on and so forth. And today with technology actually is doable. You know, it's quite doable. It's unfortunate because they miss out on a lot. But you know, mm -hmm. we all miss out on a lot by virtue of being by virtue of being who we are. I'm not taller. Had I been taller, I may have been an NBA star, for example. Oh well, yeah. As yeah. you probably would have. A Jewish Moroccan NBA star. It's very common. Yeah. I know. I've heard, I've heard of the team, yeah. Mm. Indeed. The Casablanca. <laughs> the Casablanca rioters. <laughs> yes. But it's 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 one of those things. It's very, it, 
when you talk about these things, it it all seems to come back to uh, daddy psychology, you know, Mr. Freud. It's and very unfortunate. Been... It's very unfortunate that we have discarded Freud and everything that came after Freud, because Freud was only the beginning. And he was negated and contradicted by actually most of the thinkers later on, including by contemporaries like Adler and so on. So there's been there's been like 60 years, 70 actually years, of very, very wise minds, most of them Jewish, of course, who dedicated their their brain power to observing people and deriving lessons and you know and to discard all this contemptuously as modern universities do it just shows just it just in my view it just shows what age we live in it's not you know don't get me started on the age that we live in i mean i mean, what's what's your opinion you know the 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 woke generation the one that I'm supposedly a part of being um, a millennial. I won't tell you upper or lower millennial, but yeah. Yes, keep your cards close to your chest. I will. Yeah. Um, two years ago, a group of Israeli scholars, sorry, I, I keep, you know, Jewish, Israeli, I apologize. <laughs> They're all over psychology. They're unavoidable. So a group of Israeli psychologists conducted four studies, and they came up with a new idea. It's a new, new personality construct. They called it TIV, uh, Tendency for Interpersonal Victimhood. They said that some people like to be victims. They adopt victimhood as an identity, and they create identity politics based on victimhood. They interpret their lives, they make sense of their lives based on this principle of victimhood. They anticipate being victims and they select abusers and victimizers as bosses, intimate partners, and so on and so forth, because mm -hmm. this is their comfort zone. And they organize, they organize their lives in a way which will ensure victimization. So this, this sense of um, outrage that has become a sort of social media moral currency, you know, the more outraged you are, the more, you know, the, I am moral. Therefore, I, uh, I, I am the best it's, online. It's grandiose, it's grandiose, yeah. grandiose virtue signaling. Mm -hmm. Another study, which was a very serious study in British Columbia, discovered that victimhood movements are compromised within months by narcissists and psychopaths who become the public face of the movement. And Can you give I me an example? Give me an example. This, I, there are examples in the study I just don't recall, and I, 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 you know, if I don't remember something, I don't say. But British Columbia victimhood studies and so on, published, I think, also two years ago. And from my personal experience, this is entirely true, because I have established a victimhood movement, actually. For 10 years, I've been alone on the internet. There was no one else talking about narcissism. I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse in the early 1990s. And then the, th the six support groups for victims of narcissistic abuse were all owned and moderated by me. In many ways, I'm the father of the narcissistic abuse movement, although many people don't know that. So I've, been, I've, I've had a privileged position in observing what had happened to this victimhood movement as it has evolved over the decades. Possibly a unique position because other victimhood movements are very young. Yes, so, I mean they, they they change daily. The victimhood yes. movement. I mean, we've got a new target every day on Twitter. We don't everyone, know who. It's everyone and his dog is a victim. The sociologist mm. Bradley Campbell said that we are we have transitioned from the age of dignity to the age of victimhood. Wonderfully yeah. said. So I've been able to observe what, it ha what was happening, and definitely the narcissistic abuse movement has been hijacked, lock, stock, and barrel by covert narcissists. <coughs> you okay there? <coughs> Give me a minute. No problem. <coughs> have been hijacked by <coughs> covert narcissists, overt narcissists, con artists, <coughs> and possibly psychopaths. 
So I have witnessed the hijacking of a, <clears throat> of a victimhood movement firsthand. Talk a bit <laughs> until I recover my voice. I'll talk about, yes, um, I also witness it myself um, as a journalist on a daily basis. Um, this uh, victimhood, this uh, whataboutism, this outrage movement, which I think dilutes um, the purpose of authentic revolution. There are things right now happening in this world that are worth fighting for, such as the cost of living crisis, um, you know, the Ukraine crisis, children who are homeless, people who are diseased and dying. Yet every day we believe if we write a status online and put a hashtag at the end of it, then our work is done. We are the victim. We have said our piece and we are done. And therefore, there's no real change being made in the tangible world. Yet the virtual world is awash with bees discussing, you know, oh, well, uh, this happened today and we should cancel such and such. And we should, you know, and this kind of thing. And I, I feel this, this, this stops the vehicle of change. It grinds to a halt. And therefore, what happens is we're self-censoring each other to the point of silence. To the point where the people in government will no longer listen to the demands of the people because the demands of the people change on a daily basis and ultimately mean nothing. Yeah. Um, as you see, I've regained my voice. Listening to you has a healing effect on me. That's useful to know. Now, <laughs> it's nice to know I can heal a narcissist. Yes. Well, it will be the first case live on camera. <laughs> we've, we've got one. Yeah. You haven't laid my, your hands on me, but still it worked. <laughs> so a, a very useful concept is what is locus of grandiosity. People think that narcissists want to be the best, the best, the most powerful, the richest. The, that's not true. They want to be unique. So for example, being a unique victim satisfies the narcissist's grandiosity. Being a unique loser, the likes of which the world has never seen, <laughs> I'm the world's greatest loser. That's, that's this okay. happens a lot. This ha you you see this a lot. It's almost become you know a pandemic of its own. You know this. I, I almost feel as if you know I'm at a disadvantage. Being, I'm not entirely sure, but fairly atypical. So someone like Bernie Madoff would have been proud of having pulled off the greatest Ponzi scheme. Um, someone would would be proud that. His, his company was so huge that this was the biggest bankruptcy in 10 years. You know, you just have to be special, biggest, unique. And so being a victim, the moral high ground, it's a locus of grandiosity. It satisfies the narcissist's grandiosity. I, no one has ever been a victim like me. I've been victimized more than you. And when you go to, when you go to victim forums or empath forums, they compete who has been victimized more. Like, your abuser is nothing compared to my abuser. And my story is much worse than your story. You know, and they, <laughs> they kind of get... And you see this grandiosity at play and the, the competitive streak of, you know, I'm superior to you because I'm inferior to you. You know, yes. vastly inferior. 100% I've seen... I mean, what I feel has gone from values of uh, true success and true um, hard work which is not to be confused, by the way, I'm not disparaging of anyone who is at a disadvantage who has been successful. This is separate. I'm talking about this assumption that, you know, say something really terrible happens to me, like somebody, my son likes pink, okay? I'm wearing pink right now. It's a great color. Well, I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, somebody laughs at him on the street for wearing pink and they go, oh, that's a girl's color. And then I go online in my outrage and say, my son was da da da. And then I become the face of this, my son was attacked for wearing pink movement. And then this spirals into a it's something else. And it, I, I'm just seeing a lot of this. It just keeps cropping up like weeds and we're all standing on soapboxes, not hearing each other. And I, I think it's it's really dangerous place for us to be as a society, really. And it, it concerns me. Um, and it concerns me that my generation is, you know, generalized into that because there are a lot of underground voices that that are saying, no, we're still here. 
Um, we're not covert narcissists. We're we're not professional victims. We we do still believe that you know that revolution can happen in a tangible way. I'll give you I'll give you a rule of thumb. My thumb, of course. I'll give you a rule of thumb on how to distinguish true, real movements, social rights movements, human rights movements, movements which are which are bona fide from narcissistic victimhood movements. It's a very simple rule of thumb. Go for it. The narcissist needs to differentiate himself or herself. So when a victimhood movement is hijacked by narcissists and psychopaths, it fragments. And everyone begins to make a highly specific differentiated claim. Take, for example, the, the asexuality movement. It started off as a unified movement based on an allegedly unified clinical concept. There are mm -hmm. some people who are not attracted to other people sexually. End of story. Yeah. And that, that's fine. That's absolutely but fine. But then, and th that was when it was legitimate. But then it was invaded by covert narcissists, narcissists and psychopaths. And it fragmented to a million smithereens and pieces. Now you have asexuals who masturbate or asexuals who don't masturbate. You have gray sexuals who are this way and gray sexuals who are actually demisexual. I counted there are well over 73 sub-variants of asexuality now. And you identify yourself by one of these 73. Which gives you a why, sense. Of, why is it so unique. important? Why is it so important to identify with a subsection of a subsection because of a subsection? Because it renders you unique. If you're just a garden variety asexual, well, there are millions like you. But if you are an asexual who masturbates only on Thursdays, there's only <laughs> six like you. It renders you super unique. You know? If everyone is striving to be unique, much as everyone is striving for revolution, surely once again that dilutes the term of uniqueness, that dilutes the meaning of uniqueness. Then will it not be unique to be normal? Well, normalcy had become the minority, if you ask me. What used to be oh. called normalcy had become the minority. Well, what, is the, what is normal? That's that big the big question, the typical question. Yeah. What, what is used normal? To be called normal? Yeah, but, it's become the yeah. minority. We we dispense with uh, with some really bad things, like some aspects of gender roles and so on. We dispense mm -hmm. with this, thing, and that's that's a blessing. Yes, most definitely. And the progression of women, the progression of yeah. um, you know, gay rights, trans rights, <laughs> all of those things. That must yeah. be said. These these things in in society are being changed for the better. Representation is on the rise. Um, I see that personally as separate from this victimhood mentality? I, again, the test is very simple. If it fragments to sub-sub-sub-variants and so on, the movement has been hijacked by narcissists. They want to feel special and unique. So they, they, they fragment the, the movement in order to belong to a tiny, tiny, tiny subsection and be very special. If the movement, then... is, if the movement is coherent and cohesive and uniform as a unitary facade, then it's probably legitimate. There hasn't been such fragmentation, for example, in the in the black uh, civil rights movement. There hasn't been mm -hmm. such fragmentation. To, to the, you know, there's been a debate about strategies, but there hasn't been a fragmentation. I'm a black guy who lives on the left side of the street, so my victimhood is different to yours because you live on the right side of the street. There hasn't been such nonsense. And similarly, I think in the gay in the gay rights movement, there hasn't been such something like this, but. In many but when it comes movies. to, say, J.K. Rowling and feminism, mm. there's been fragmentation with yes. that in terms yes. of, you know, obviously trans women are recognised as female on their, you know, it gets changed on their driving licence. They are feminism, they are known as... Feminism is an example of an interesting... Yeah, it's become extremely fragmented, yes. extremely... Yes. Fra and, you know, um, the NHS website in the UK has changed, you know, people with a cervix, yet for males it's not people with people with a scrotum it's an article, men. an article i submitted was was denied publication because i refused to change two words i refused to call students or pupils scholars and i refused to call pregnant women 
people, pregnant people. The article was rejected. And I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Another, another article I submitted to to actually a UK outlet. I didn't submit. I was I was solicited uh, to a UK outlet, and they inserted a paragraph without my permission that says they may do that. <laughs> and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do anything. But then the, the the paragraph says that pathological narcissism is totally normal because to to attack pathological narcissism is ableism. I'm not kidding you. It's it's discriminatory. It's disgusting. You should not demonize people. You should not. You know, it's they are they are disabled, and this is ableism. This is a form of. Do you feel you are disabled? I am disabled. But so if, if I'm if a danger, I'm if I'm a danger to others and to society, others and society have a full right to defend themselves. First and foremost, by spreading the knowledge that I'm a danger. And this is not ableism. This is self-defense. But then, yeah, when does that? Where does that line get drawn? I mean, do we then defend um, the the paedophiles? Do we then defend the the people behind bars in prison? Is is that then ableist? If the, if they're psychopathic, and I call them disgusting, am I ableist? Yes, according to this, yes, paedophiles need mental mental health care. They need care. Well, they don't need demonizing. They need care. Although there is a subset of paedophiles that say they do not indulge in physical paedophilia and they are seeking rights. This is to... actually the majority. These are these are the majority of paedophiles. But paedophiles I didn't do know need that. care. Paedophiles do need care. However, this doesn't exclude the fact that we should be very wary of paedophiles and castigate them and chastise them and isolate them and spread the information wide and far that they're dangerous exactly i mean i'm would i tell my child you know you, this pair this person this known pedophile is perfectly fine to go and play with on your own yeah. uh, for fear of being called ableist no i would not that's how far how far it's gone that's how far it's it, gone it's got I, I don't know i mean i know that society what the, hell, what the hell is a pregnant what the hell is pregnant people can you explain this to me because I this can is the explain, official. I can explain this to you. I can explain this to you. Um, so you have a biological woman, or somebody who identifies as wo a woman, um, or you have a trans woman. Um, a biological female may not necessarily identify as a female. Um, they may identify as gender fluid or male, or just. How is this? How does any of this have? Because we have one minute left. How does any of this have to do with pregnancy? Only women can get pregnant. End of story. Only biological women can get pregnant, yes. but uh, the term for womanhood has apparently changed. I'm a medical doctor. Only biological women can get pregnant. End of story. Or people but that gender, have women. So gender women cannot get pregnant. They can't, no, but the, the word woman has changed its meaning. It has become fluid. That's rank nonsense, because a subset of women can get pregnant. I'm not saying that... Yeah. Biological women can yes. get pregnant. Okay, or, it's still not or, people. Or, or uh, people who are biologically have female parts but do not identify as women can also get pregnant. Uh, so yes, the definition of womanhood has um, completely changed in recent years, probably the last... I would say five years, it's slowly becoming to the point where the word female is not recognized um, as separate, uh, you know, as a biological thing. It's, it's not separate from biology. It's, mm. it's, I mean, it is separate from, it's, it's a very difficult subject um, for a lot of people. A lot of people are divided on it and it has, as you say, become extremely fractured. I mean, uh, J.K. Rowling was one of the, UK's most, well, the world's most beloved authors, uh, still is to many people, created an empire. Uh, now even the actors um, who she helped bring to fame are denouncing her because she um, she says that she believes that biological sex still has relevance. The rape of been... language, the rape of yes. language is a common narcissistic strategy. Narcissists rape language. They arbitrarily redefine words. 
They mix half-truths and half-lies. They create plausible scenarios and pull the wool over your eyes. They misinterpret things you have said. If they are psychopathic, they gaslight you. Language is a major instrument in the hands of the narcissist. Any movement, social law, which seeks to redefine language in a way that creates controversy to this extent, must be highly narcissistic and compromised. What do you see for the future in terms of our, the way that we're leaning um, with social media and narcissism and the way we present ourselves, professional victimhood? What do you see for the future of the next generation in terms of, you know, identity and and this this, you know, this political outrage that seems to um, last about two seconds before the next wave of political outrage then surfaces? It's not real outrage. It's virtual signaling. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I've been. There's no real calling outrage. It, I'm, I'm calling it outrage for the, yeah. this. Sake, it's sake it's out, outrage it. between Netflix and and, uh, and red wine. That's that's the kind of outrage. Exactly. It's not real burning yeah. outrage that yeah. we're talking about here. And it's yeah. really first hand. It's really first hand. The the activists are utterly divorced from the previous social movements. The activists were the victims. Now we have a whole a whole layer of parasitic, you know, a whole a whole series of parasitic layers growing on real victims. Should they ever, should they, if they exist? I mean, in many cases they don't exist; they are invented. But in some cases they do exist. But there are this, this parasitic superstructure, which leverages the victimhood in order to obtain fifteen minutes of fame, and, and so on. It's totally narcissistic. As to the future. All the elements of the narcissistic pathology ex have, do exist right now um, in terms of technology. The only missing part was the fantasy, the shared fantasy. We had grandiosity. We had everything is embedded in the algorithms and the coding of technology and social media mm -hmm. and so on. So we have mm -hmm. relative positioning, codification of envy and rage, um, likes, competition in, in the form of likes, and, and so on and so forth. So narcissism has been codified into the technological infrastructure. But one critical exactly. thing... What, we all what, seek it, though. We all seek it. We, I, all I mean... have, we, all, we all have narcissistic defenses, and we all have healthy narcissism. Yeah. Or think... unhealthy as it, as it was. I mean, if say I post a selfie to social media where I think I look good, you know, I I want to put that there. I, I want feedback because, you know, within a world of homogenized beauty, you, you want to you want your own beauty to be recognized. I mean, you want to stand that, out. That... You, you want to stand out. You want to be special. That's not something. Unique. That's not something I would have thought about 10 years ago. I would have been posting a silly picture with my friends and it would it would look ridiculous and the mm. angles would be off. There'd be no filter on it. it. It it just wouldn't be that choreographed. But now everything is choreographed, including my own pictures, including the pictures of everybody else. You know, we, we haven't got these sloppy, candid shots anymore. You know, it's... It's, it's we, not we, about we... life. It's, it's not about life. It's about spectacle. Mm. Um, exactly. Exactly. And, fantasy. Yeah. Shared fantasy. It's a famous book, Society of the Spectacle. It's, it's about spectacle. So no, oh. fantasy was missing. You had everything. You had grandiosity, you had, you had narcissistic supply, you had relative positioning, you had competition, you had rage, you had envy. All the elements of narcissistic pathology were codified, hard codified, into, hard coded, I'm sorry, into uh, all technology platforms. There was one thing missing, one big thing missing. The shared fantasy. And now it's coming. It's called the metaverse. The metaverse yeah. is a shared fantasy. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to create shared fantasies in the metaverse with real or imaginary. It's actually scary, everyone, the idea. Everyone will have an avatar. In other words, everyone will become an internal object. You will not be interacting with external objects, but only with their representations in your mind. This is total descent to narcissism. This is a total descent to us. Would We're you feel you fit in there? Sorry? Would you feel that you fit in 
if we descend into total narcissism within a decade, would you feel that you could walk among us as as your own? This has been my world much more than than other people's long long before the metaverse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I've made it my life's mission to warn against narcissism and its uh, and its effects. Therefore, so, achieving uniqueness. In in a way, yes, it's it's kind of brand. Kind of brand of uniqueness, yes. I branded myself as a fighter against narcissism. And actually a whistleblower. I like blower. the brand. I like the brand. Your video is a whistleblower. Clear, it's a whistleblower yeah. brand. A brand. Yeah. It's a whistleblower and a, and a traitor. It's a whistleblower and a, blower and a traitor. Combined. I have betrayed my kind. And I'm bringing you the news as a whistleblower. These are not very likable characters. The traitor and the whistleblower. They can be in years to come. They're the ones who are often remembered. But that has been my life's mission. So the metaverse terrifies me because I know more than most, I think, um, how it is to be in a shared fantasy. The pool of the shared fantasy, the gravitational pool of the shared fantasy, the inability to extricate yourself, the addictive quality, qualities of the shared fantasy, and finally, and most importantly, the objectification and conversion of everyone else in the shared fantasy into a set of symbols, manipulable symbols, simply internal objects. And this just makes me want to get in a time machine and go, it's go back the situation to is somewhere really bad. else. Yeah, I, 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 I not, dread it. I mean, I'm a, I'm a grumpy old man, of course, but and grumpy old men tend to disparage um, younger generations. It's a, it's a hobby of us, you know, we old men. We, we do it. It's a hobby. But I don't think I'm... I think I'm being pretty realistic about this. No, I think uh, you are. I agree with you. I think things are going from bad to worse and have been going from bad to worse for a long time now, like decades. Yep. I think we, as a, as a humanity, as a species, humanity, we've been utterly traumatized by the two world wars, which created enormous dislocations and disorientation and distrust of institutions and, and authorities and expertise and need to revert to something bigger than yourself. So, you know, religion or cult. We see it in uh, journalism as well. Um, often, you know, fake news and all this kind of thing. You know, we, we're fighting social media and what people fail to recognize is that journalism is not social media. We are going to say things that you don't like. We are going to inform you of things that you don't want to hear. We are not going to cater to your algorithm. And that that's why people have lost trust in the media. I'm not saying that every single media outlet is trustworthy. However, I will say that most most media outlets in most free speaking worlds are filled with professional people in the pursuit of truth which has then been molded by tech companies in the pursuit of clicks which you know you, we're giving you the media that you asked for we're giving you cats on skateboards we're giving you you know the the mum who got upset because her daughter's hair was cut wrong this is what you asked for and yes, then we give you real news and you call it scaremongering. And that this, you know, this metaverse is swallowing a, a lot of industries. Yes, but you, uh, uh, traditional media, also known as MSM, mainstream media, <laughs> traditional media have, have been established on the, on the assumption that people do seek the truth and value the truth. People don't want the truth. Never have actually. It was self-delusional. People don't want the truth. They want the truth. Pe there is what I call malignant egalitarianism. The belief that the truth is, is moldable and malleable, that, that your opinion is as good as my opinion, and that your opinion is, can actually, is easily can be interpreted as a fact. But how can, we, how can we relate opinion to facts? Opinion and facts are not the same. Your opinion is a fact, actually, and that's is why it? It's easy to, it is a fact. It's a fact. I don't believe my opinion is a fact. a fact. I believe to, no, but it's a fact that you have an opinion. It's a fact that I have an opinion, but my opinion well, is. Well, that's not where fact. it ends. That's where it ends. People lack critical thinking and so on. So opinions are, are absolutely interpreted as fact. But then, absolutely. how would you ever learn? 
How would you learn? There's no no need to learn, people believe. There has been a tremendous drop in enrollment in higher education. It, it's fallen off a cliff, especially among men. There's no need to learn anymore. It's fake it till you make it. It's Tony Robbins, awaken the giant within. It's the law of attraction. I, it's I the secret. His, uh, did you see Do Tony Robbins' documentary on Netflix, I Am Not Your Guru? It's It's get rich quick shortcut mentality and learning is perceived as an obstacle for the feeble-minded because you end up with student debt and learning outside higher education institutions is also frowned upon because it challenges your centrality as a generator of truth and fact you have an equal status to everyone else your facts are as important as as valuable as my facts. I and feel that to be egotistical and incorrect. Egotistical is is, is another issue, but, but incorrect, it's a threat. It's a threat to survival, of course. And when I people... feel that, you know, this the world that we're living in now with the financial crises, um, get rich quick, only fans, drop shipping, TikTok, influencers. This is the kind of thing, you know, that this is the kind of thing people need now to survive and get the kind of revenue stream coming into their household in order to put food on the table for their children. Uh, people have almost had to mold themselves to the metaverse. Um, because going through a traditional path of education has left them with nothing but debt and high taxes. Mm -hmm. So we have to mould ourselves to narcissism, professional victimhood and outrage in order to make something of ourselves and get noticed and then maybe someone will, will give a shit. Hence, hence my contention that narcissism has become a positive adaptation in today's civilization. It's, it pays to be a narcissist. It's a good, good thing. But you've also called it a stage four cancer at some point. In, uh, the, there is a difference between the individual good and the public, the public's welfare. So individuals can thrive in a society that's dying. Actually, individuals often thrive in societies that, that are dying. Because yeah, I mean, look, look what happened during the pandemic. I mean, um, some of the biggest companies in the world made um, record, record numbers of sales. And similarly, in Nazi Germany, many people became, you know, very rich and, and, mm -hmm. and so on. So societies can decay and die and collapse and even whole species can. Individuals, the, the collective good is not the sum of individual good. That's a common utilitarian um, mistake. <laughs> um, so people are atomized and they leverage technology to, to secure, secure a living or whatever. And it's going to work, actually. It's going to work. It's like the famous um, Jewish joke, you know, I give you a dollar, you give it back to me, we have a turnover of two dollars. <laughs> it, it's going to work. People are going to trade the same dollar in a variety of ways, generating a livelihood for all of them. Ultimately, it will all come crashing down because there's no underlying value. It's make-believe. It's, a mani it's manipulation of symbols. And because we don't recognize the separate existence of other people, we will lose our ability to collaborate, which was the cornerstone of our success as a species. I was about to say the exact same thing. Is that not, you know, our, our social ability, is, is that not the reason that we have survived so long? Of course it is. Don't go far. Look at families. Look what happened to the family. It, it contracted and contracted and contracted. And now we are at pains to maintain a family of two. We, and we also fail. community. Community. Communities well, are there I mean, longer. I'm talking about family, nuclear families. Not we, in certain regions of France, I'll have you know. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> community is very much alive. Yeah, well, special part, special areas in the Middle East as well. Yes, but but these, <laughs> these are temporary. Gemstones. These are temporary enclaves because the the, the pressures and, and stresses mediated by money and corporate greed and so on are, are too strong. They're, no one will survive this onslaught. It's a tsunami. It's coming. You may believe yourself isolated, but it's coming. 
So no, I certainly do not. It's terrifying. We can't we can't manage a long term commitment to a single partner. We can't. Fifty one percent of marriages end in divorce in every single year. It's very misleading because ultimately the, the real figure is much higher. Seventy percent of second marriages end in divorce and eighty one percent of third marriages end in divorce. The effective figure is three quarters. And we can't even manage to be with one person, to compromise, to share, to negotiate. To, we fail constantly, repeatedly. 31% of adults are lifelong singles. So how can we think of, of larger friends? And indeed, everything is falling apart. And the distrust is enormous. You saw it during the pandemic. Distrust of medical authorities, of expertise, of education, the distrust is total, total. I, I never thought I'd see so many people uh, refuse a vaccine. Not only the, the vaccine, but advice, not connected to the vaccine, um, analysis and so on. People rejected medical authorities in favor of quacks, neighbors, aunties, and grandmas, you know. They regarded those as much more reliable sources than doctors and, and so on. So we are in trouble in trouble because we are discarding the elites, especially the intellectual elites. The repository, the institutional repository of human knowledge is with these elites. By discarding them, mocking them, decrying them, deriding them, diminishing them, we are giving up on, on the legacy. And without that, we will not survive. We will not survive. There are major threats like climate change, and they are terminal threats, like the gender wars. I regard the gender wars as a much bigger threat than climate change. Much bigger threat. And we can't get our act together. Simply can't. You saw it in monkeypox. We can't get our act together. End of story. It's doomed. That's it. We don't know how no, to every, every day I go online and I see people who can't get their act together constantly, probably including myself. Um, and I think it's just, I, I, I really fear for the world in which my two sons will grow up in. I really do. I have deep concerns it takes about... In, it takes about, inordinate courage, courage or inordinate stupidity to bring a child to the world. And I'm not sure what is the more prevalent. But it takes no. definitely inordinate courage. It's... Um, and nowadays, I'm talking now, like to make a decision to bring a child now to the world. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously my decision was made um, nine years ago, but if I have my decision again, yeah. who knows, you know, because it's 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 unsustainable. We've, even in a double-income household with um, educated people, it's, it's, it's actually life has become unsustainable. Yes, that's a good, uh, a good summary. Life has become unsustainable, true. That's so it. We're going to we're gonna transition. We're going to transition from reality in life to fantasy it's a defense fantasy is a defense reality has become so unbearable so untenable so unmanageable that we're going to migrate en masse to fantasy we're going to remain stuck there we will never exit there's no reason for you to leave the metaverse your company will have its office on, in the metaverse you will have sex in the metaverse you'll buy your clothes in the metaverse you'll order pizza in the metaverse you will never have to leave your couch. Totally atomized. You will never see a human face. In the year 2016, a majority of men and women in the United States haven't, haven't had any interaction with someone of the opposite sex, heterosexual men and women. Majority. I find that really hard to believe. Yes, it sounds unbelievable. Sounds, oh, unbelievable. sounds terrifying. That's where, we're, a... that's where we're headed. Yeah. Where we're headed. yeah. Wow. It's been very enlightening, um, as always, and your words and expertise never fail to amaze me. Thank you. So thank, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the incident in the middle. I, I had a medical procedure yesterday and I haven't recovered fully. 
Oh no, it's fine. It's no worries. Thank you for coming along to do the interview anyway. And um, yeah, so let's all just go and down a bottle of wine or something because uh, or, the world is screwed. <laughs> or, or something harder. We're not going to details. Not in public. <laughs> okay, in public. thank you. No, no. Thank you. All it's right, thank you very much. Yes. You have a lovely day. Take yes. care. Safe Bye. Thank you. Bye.